Hey, and welcome to tonight's presentation put on by the Medina County Board of Developmental Disabilities. My name is Tiffany Ziegler and I am the Training and Compliance Specialist here at the Medina County Board. Tonight joining us is Attorney Derek Graham and he's going to speak to us on guardianship and supported decision making. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Derek. Thanks Tiffany, I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining tonight. Uh, my name is Derek Graham. I am an attorney here in uh, Dublin, Ohio and I have a small law firm. I've been practicing law for 17 years now and the first five years I was happily doing business and litigation and all that stuff and then 13 years ago my wife and I had our first daughter and she was born with Down syndrome and so that threw me in the world of being the parent of a, an individual with special needs and uh, it's, it's funny how life works because I started having people ask me a lot of questions about developmental disability law topics and uh, I didn't know a lot of the answers at the time and I got connected with an attorney from the Department of Developmental Disabilities who became a, a great friend and a great mentor to me and taught me a lot of the ins and outs of developmental disability law. So fast forward 13 years later now pretty much all I do all day every day is work with families who have loved ones with developmental disabilities. And so what does that mean? Uh, that means I work with families um, certainly with helping get eligible for benefits like SSI and SSD and, and understanding how those benefits work and a lot of the special needs estate planning, um, helping understand you know waivers and benefits and how to get eligible and, and access to those. But a lot of what it deals with is what we're going to talk about tonight, which is decision making. Uh, it, it pertains a lot to um, decision making in the context of um, decision making in the context of um, guardianship and what happens when an individual turns 18. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you guys are seeing that. Are you seeing my presentation now? We are. OK, great. Um, and what we'll do is I'm certainly happy to make these slides available afterwards. I'll make sure we get them to Tiffany. So if anybody wants a copy of these, don't feel like you have to frivolously take notes or, or feverishly take notes or anything like that. So. Guardianship and supported decision making is what we'll talk about. This is a topic that becomes really important to families as your loved one with a developmental disability starts to approach that 18th birthday. Because when the, an individual turns 18, several things happen. There are privacy laws that go into effect. There are uh, decision making issues that arise. All kinds of things happen at that age of 18. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about um, capacity versus competency and how that plays into the decision that parents face and family members face in terms of what should happen and, and what the options are for an individual who has a developmental disability. We'll talk about alternatives to guardianship and supported decision making and, and how those factor in. We'll talk about when guardianship is appropriate. A lot of individuals absolutely will need a guardianship, will need a guardian as an adult, and there are a lot of individuals who won't need a guardian as an adult. So when is it appropriate? We'll talk a little bit about the scope of guardianship authority and then we'll talk about uh, some of the limitations to guardianship and, and how the rights of an individual are affected when there's a guardianship in play as well. So starting out, some of the challenges that face us in the context of guardianship is that we have so many different reasons or so many different factors that go into why a person might need a guardian. And one of the challenges that face lawmakers and probate judges and, and people like that are that the different causes for a guardianship are, um, are challenging because it's hard to have a set of rules that apply to everyone who might need a guardian because there's so many different reasons you might need a guardian uh, that, that we have to really be cognizant of how the laws affect different people. In other words, a guardianship for an elderly individual who's 90 years old with Alzheimer's is very different than a guardianship for a 20 year old who has autism and is very um, free spirited. So there, those are different challenges and, and different ways that we try to assist those individuals. But before we ever get to guardianship, so what generally happens in my practice is a family will call us and they'll say we want to make an appointment and they come in and their loved one is facing that 18th birthday. And when that happens, uh, we have to talk about decision making because when an individual turns 18, there are several privacy walls that go up. Uh, for example, you've probably heard of some of these, but we have things like um, HIPAA, which governs health care privacy. We have FERPA, which governs education privacy. 
Ohio has a common law right to privacy. So we have all these different laws that go into effect that govern the privacy of an individual. And that includes an individual with a developmental disability. And so right out of the gate, sometimes parents are afraid that they might be shut out or kept away from information based on the fact that their loved one is an adult. So the first thing we look at is how do we get access to information? And then secondly, we look at decision making. Is, the, is this individual someone who could make some of their own decisions? They just need support with making their decisions? Or is this an individual who might not be able to make decisions or might struggle with making the appropriate decisions where it may be better if we have someone else making their decisions? And then even if we do that, how do we still incorporate those into the decisions that are being made on their behalf? But to really figure out what's the right course of action because for families there's there's three things that can happen and i think only two of them are reasonable there's families who take the do nothing approach and the do nothing approach when you have a loved one with a developmental disability the first thing i'll tell you is for parents it works well a surprising percentage of the time it's not supposed to but we still, and it blows up, eventually it always blows up, but it works well for a longer period of time than it should for most individuals. What do I mean by that? So I, like I told you, I have a daughter with Down syndrome. So she turns 18, let's say my wife and I do nothing. And we take her to her primary care physician appointment. And we take her to her endocrinologist or her heart doctor. And she, it seems like she has every medical specialist you can think of. So we take her to those appointments you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't how often those medical providers will just continue to provide information to my wife and I they see a young woman with down syndrome with her parents so of course they're going to share information with the parents they're not supposed to though but I find that a lot of parents if they just go in and act like of course they have access to information people give them access to information but again they're not supposed to and sooner or later that parent will run into that office manager who's a real stickler and who understands that they're not supposed to freely share that information and then it becomes very problematic likewise FERPA Family Education Right to Privacy Act uh, says you know schools are supposed to view the situation differently they're not supposed to freely share information with my wife and I uh, so there's all kinds of laws that should be going into effect that should be governing our access to information about Megan our daughter with Down syndrome so the second option is what I call structured supported decision making. And we'll talk about structured supported decision making. And the third option is guardianship. Now, under Ohio law, we know that guardianship is supposed to be the last resort. And I will say, I think a lot of individuals and a lot of families who have loved ones with developmental disabilities are a little bit too quick to go to guardianship. And there has been a bit of an, an evolution over the last several years in terms of how we view and when we view guardianship as being appropriate. Uh, there are a lot of individuals with developmental disabilities who don't necessarily need a guardian. But again, sticking with my family as an example, when my daughter turns 18, like I said, she has Down syndrome, and I can already tell you two things. Um, if I want to go get guardianship of her, I probably won't have any struggle doing so. Just by virtue of having a daughter with Down syndrome, I'm sure I can find a doctor that's willing to say that she needs a guardian and it puts the court in a position of where it's really hard for a court to deny a guardianship when the parent thinks they need a guardian and you've got medical ex experts that think the person needs a guardian and they have that diagnosis even though guardianship isn't supposed to hinge on any one diagnosis and because of some of those biases that are no fault of the judiciary and no fault of the, the doctors involved it, it makes it extra important that the parents really take their time and critically think through is guardianship the right course of action are we really at the point where we need to pursue that last resort of guardianship or can we pursue that middle ground of decision or i'm sorry supported decision making and so that's where we'll start is in that middle ground so how do you know how do you know if your individual could uh, get by with structured supported decision making how do you know if they they need guardianship a lot of that understanding comes down to um, thinking about the, the term incompetent, which is a legal term, and decisional capacity. Understanding those two terms, competence versus capacity, go a long way towards helping us identify correctly who does and who doesn't need a guardian. So when we think about decision-making capacity, 
That is a medical term and it describes a person's ability to make a specific decision. So if I were to say to Tiffany, you know, Tiffany, what, what do you want to eat for dinner tonight? Do you want chicken or do you want to uh, go get a salad somewhere? She knows what we're talking about. Um, she would, maybe I say, do you want Mexican or do you want pizza? You know, she knows what that means. She can think about everything from the health implications to the taste, to the cost, to what restaurant I might be talking about. She can think that through and she can make a decision. That is her exercising decisional capacity, taking the inputs, thinking about the question and making that decision. Almost everyone has decisional capacity in certain areas of life. My daughter with Down syndrome, she's only 13, but I assure you she is full of opinions and she has lots of decisional making capacity in areas of life. I mean, you ask her about what she wants for dinner and she will tell you. You ask her what she doesn't want for dinner and she will tell you. You ask her what she wants to do outside, she will tell you. She knows what those questions are. She can think about it and she can make those choices. Now, for guardianship, uh, we have to think about the term of competence or incompetence, and that's a legal term. And it's a legal term that's defined as any person who is so mentally impaired as a result of a mental or physical illness or disability, as a result of intellectual disability, i.e. developmental disability, or as a result of chronic substance abuse that the person is incapable of taking proper care of the person's self or property. Now, when we say incompetent in the legal stamp from a legal perspective, we're not talking about any one decision. There's never a scenario where one bad decision should render a person in need of having a guardian. When we talk about being incompetent, we're really looking, or really it's the probate judge who's looking at decision making on the whole, looking at all of a person's ability or inability to make decisions and can they get by in terms of making their own decisions or can they not? So again, just to kind of re rehash before we move on, decision-making capacity is looking at a specific decision. Can they make that specific decision? Whereas competence or rather incompetence for, term, for purposes of guardianship is looking at all of the decisions a person might make. So looking at all their decisions more on a, a spectrum and, and how, how are they doing? So in terms of looking, I'm gonna skip this slide and, and come back to it. Um, in looking at supported decision-making, the way I define structured supported decision making, and again, supported decision making is a buzzword. And if you Google it, I'm going to warn you up front. If you Google supported decision making, you will read lots of different things. And that's because we have 20 some, I think it's 23 states that now have statutes that define supported decision making. And almost all of them do it slightly differently. And they have different definitions of what it means. And in Ohio, we don't have a standardized or statutory definition of supported decision making. So you could ask two very smart, two very well intending people, what does it mean? And they might describe it very differently. And it makes it hard for parents to then do internet research or figure out what it means to them because we don't have this one agreed upon definition. But it is even here in Ohio, a very much um, agreed upon and useful alternative to, to guardianship. So structured supported decision making. What I refer to that as is first of all, with parents, phase one of structured supported decision making is making sure parents have access to information. All those different privacy laws that I talked about, HIPAA, FERPA, all those weird acronyms, we would have the individual sign waivers saying, I waive that privacy law. I want mom and dad to have access to information. Uh, I want mom and dad to be able to talk to the school and vice versa and medical providers. And anytime that general privacy law kicks in, you know, if you call Tiffany or someone at the Medina County Board of Developmental Disabilities, they're not supposed to just start sharing information with, with even with moms and dads. When the person is an adult, you know, that person has a common law right to privacy and even county boards are covered under HIPAA. So they're supposed to be mindful of certain privacy laws and, and things in terms of how they share information, but they can be given permission to share information. And so that's phase one of structured supported decision making is saying, all right, I give permission for these people to share information with my parents or my siblings or these people who are who I've chosen to have access to my information. And then the second phase of it is power of attorneys where we say, all right, if I encounter a decision I can't make, this is who I want making the decision on my behalf. 
So for financial or general durable power attorney, it's saying if I need help with banking or something like that, I give mom and dad permission to step in and help make decisions on my behalf. Healthcare power of attorney, if I need help with a medical decision, this is who I want helping me. Um, Ohio's developmental disability system has something called the assisted decision maker designation, where I can sign a paper saying, if I am making decisions regarding my ISP, that individualized service plan, or my waiver services, or something like that, I want mom and dad to be included in that conversation and that decision. And so phase one is giving the parents access to information. Phase two is giving parents the ability to be involved in the decisions, especially when I can't make the decisions. So this sounds great, but then the question becomes, well, who can sign all of these documents? Um, can just anyone sign these documents or what does it take? In Ohio, the statutes say that any individual with sound mind can sign these documents. And I, I despise that term because in Ohio Revised Code, the term sound mind isn't defined anywhere. And what that means is it's left up to the court system to figure it out. It's left up to you, you know, in your county, be Judge Dunn and your magistrate who'd be tasked with figuring out what does sound mind mean? And every time a court, you won't find very many published opinions on this, but every single time a court has been asked to define sound mind and they've done so in a written decision, they have always gone back to it being a functional test that really mean that that sound mind really means capacity. It means decisional capacity. Did they understand that document and that decision to sign that document? So. When my daughter turns 18 and I'm sitting there thinking, can I do structured supported decision making for her? The issue first becomes not whether or not she's incompetent, not whether or not if we look at all of her decisions on the whole, how does she do? The first thing we start with is more of a microscopic look at. Does she have decisional capacity to sign a HIPAA waiver? Um, and so then it becomes an issue of what is a HIPAA waiver? It's a document that says mom and dad can talk to the doctor. And so in our practice, you know, us attorneys end up becoming the gatekeepers a lot of time for who can and, and can't sign these documents. So the conversation I end up having with clients is, you know, are you OK with mom and dad talking to your doctors? And if the individual understands what that document accomplishes, I don't care that the whether the individual understands every single legal term because us attorneys use some weird words, all the now, wherefore and heretofore and all those those weird words us attorneys use. What I what I care about when I'm meeting with the individual is do they understand what the document accomplishes? Do they have a basic understanding that this document means mom and dad have access to information, that mom and dad have the ability to make decisions for me when I can't? Now, one of the keys to structured supported decision making is, though, even once the documents are signed, the individual is still the decision maker. So with guardianship, we are changing the decision maker from the individual to mom or dad with structured or maybe some other family member. I don't want to just assume it'd be a parent. With structured supported decision making, the individual is still the decision maker, but we're tearing down those privacy walls. So mom and dad or the designated individual has a seat at the table while the individual's making the decision. And when the individual encounters a decision that he or she can't make, then mom and dad have the legal authority to step in and make that decision on their behalf. All right, now Tiffany mentioned at the beginning, we do have the Q&A uh, available. I don't know if that pops up and tells me if a question comes in or not. So Tiffany, if you see one come in, please feel free to interrupt me, but this would be a good time to ask a question if you have one about supported decision-making so far, because we're gonna move into guardianship next. Derek, I'm not sure if they're seeing the Q&A box. I don't see it on my end right at the moment, but I'm working on it with our IT. So um, just keep going and if we get anything popping through, then I'll, I'll get you towards All the right. end. Yep, just feel free to let me know. And at the end, I will give you my email address and all my contact info. So you're more than welcome to email me later if you have questions on all of this. Thank you. All right, so not everyone has decision making capacity. You know, we, we'd like to think that, but but some individuals don't. And in those circumstances, we do need to go the route of, of guardianship. And we do that because legally we need to have someone in place that has the authority to give consent for health care they can give consent for placement uh, they can step in and make decisions now guardianship <laughs> there has been more in the news about guardianship over the last year than there has been for the probably the five years 
prior to that. And a lot of that hinges on one person, and you all know who that is, it's Britney Spears. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff in about Britney Spears and her conservatorship. And in California, what they call conservatorship is guardianship in the state of Ohio. So that is the same thing we're talking about, but we do have slightly different laws in Ohio versus what they have in California. Uh, there's also a movie that was on Netflix that you know will make your skin crawl a little bit in the beginning. It's called I Care A Lot. Uh, that has a lot of themes of guardianship and guardian abuse in it. And it starts out a little bit unrealistic, but just realistic enough to make really attorneys kind of nauseous. And then if you've seen the movie, then it goes off the deep end in a, in a Hollywood way really fast. But there's been a lot of publicity of guardianship. And I do worry sometimes that, that some parents who really do need to pursue guardianship for their children may be hesitant to do so because of some of this publicity. But for some individuals, it is a necessary tool. Now, again, it should be the last resort. So if you're sitting there and you're on the fence, try supported decision making first, give it a shot. Uh, there's no statute of limitations on guardianship, meaning if your loved one turns 18, then give it a try. And if it's not working when they're 18 and a half or 19 or at some future point, you can always go establish guardianship then uh, if, if something's not working well. I always tell families guardianship is a lot like a tattoo. It's easier to put on than it is take off. And that, that doesn't mean you can't get a guardianship terminated. You can, it's called a restoration and we'll talk about it here in a minute, but it is harder to do. And so I think if you're on the fence, I would encourage you to explore supported decision-making first before you, you jump in and pursue guardianship. But what does the guardianship process look like? What does it mean to go pursue guardianship? With guardianship, what you're doing is you're going to your county probate court. Uh, in your county, it's Judge Dunn, very nice guy. He's got some, some good magistrates working for him. And a lot of guardianship work does play out in front of the magistrates but, um, most of the time. So you go to your probate court and it's in large part a paperwork process. Um, we have different types of guardianship. We have guardianship of the person and guardianship of the estate. Most if the overwhelming majority of individuals with developmental disabilities will only ever need a guardianship of the person. You don't really need or want a guardianship of the estate. And that's because for most individuals with developmental disabilities, their estate consists of maybe some social security benefits, SSI or SSD, maybe a little bit of money from, from working, but normally we're not dealing with a lot of large estates because if they have large estates, they get kicked off some of the other benefits that they really need, like Medicaid, Medicaid waivers, SSI, and all that stuff. So guardian of the person is the larger of the two categories of guardianship. Uh, it covers things like medical decisions, residential placement, day programming, uh, any kind of behavioral restrictions, all that's covered under guardianship of the person. To establish guardianship, you go through a paperwork application process. Uh, you're going to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork. You, generally speaking, do not have to hire an attorney to, to establish a guardianship of the person. We have lots of clients that do it on their own. Uh, we have lots of clients that hire attorneys to do it. I do think hiring attorneys makes the process easier, but it's certainly not something you're, you're required to do. Uh, and, and just to head off any questions, I am happy to work with with any family in Medina County, but I would not let a family from Medina County ever hire us to pursue a guardianship only because it would be unfair to you and probably unethical of me to charge you what it would cost for me to have to drive from Columbus to Medina just for a guardianship. And, and it's, it's not something that's that complicated, a guardianship of the person. So I would encourage you to look to local Medina County attorneys for those kind of, of roles. Um, now, state planning, other stuff we're happy to help with, but, but the guardianship, I would encourage you to, to look to, to a local Medina County attorney if, if you're wanting to pursue that. So you fill out all kinds of paperwork as part of your application phase, and that includes what's called a statement of expert evaluation, which is a, a statement that has to be filled out by a medical doctor. You submit it to the court. Once you submit it to the court, they're going to send a uh, probate court investigator out to serve the individual, to serve your child with notice of the hearing. They're required to go through certain rights that 
probate court investigator is what we call the eyes and the ears of the probate court. They're supposed to kind of assess the situation and, and write up a report that the magistrate or the judge can read and rely upon when trying to figure out if guardianship is the right choice. There will be a hearing. And at that hearing, the person who has applied for guardianship bears the burden of proving two things. One, that the individual meets that legal definition of being incompetent. And secondly, that the person who has applied is the best suited person to serve as guardian. And so whoever applies for guardianship has to prove those two things, the need for guardianship and the suitability of the applicant. And if there are multiple applicants, then it's the responsibility of the probate court to decide who is the most suitable, who's the best possible person that can serve as guardian of this individual. Once guardianship is established, and it's usually established at a hearing with a magistrate, and then there's this little legal process where the magistrate's decision is, is confirmed by a, um, the probate judge, they will issue what's called a letter of guardianship. And that letter of guardianship is a court order that we'll talk a little bit about in a second. But what you also need to know is even once the guardianship is established, the probate court will always remain involved. The probate court is what's called the superior guardian. And that means they have the final say on any decisions pertaining to guardianship. Now, I'm not here to speak for Judge Dunn. It's my understanding he's coming to a, a meeting next month, and I think that's great. Um, one thing I will tell you, though, in, in my experience, and I've been to every probate court in the state of Ohio because one of my clients is an agency that goes all over the state. Uh, I haven't met a probate judge yet that has any interest in micromanaging or getting involved in the day-to-day -day decisions a guardian wants or makes. So sometimes families will be hesitant to pursue guardianship because of this thought that a probate judge might have the final say on decisions. And that, in my opinion, is not a valid reason to hesitate on pursuing guardianship because, again, probate judges and probate magistrates, they're only going to get involved if something's going wrong or if someone's complaining about the decisions you're making. They are not there to get in the weeds on the day-to-day -day basis in terms of guardianship cases. Uh, they want to appoint you. They want you to make good decisions uh, because that's what's best for the individual and that's certainly what's best for their courts. Once the guardianship is established, uh, the court's going to issue the letter of guardianship. And what is a letter of guardianship? The Supreme Court has said that letter of guardianship is a court order. It's a court order that says who the decision maker is for this individual. And then the scope of that authority is more defined by statute, statutory provisions and certain cases and even certainly some what we call rules that pertain to guardianship as well. If you are someone's guardian, you need to get a copy of that letter of guardianship. And I always tell clients, you wanna make sure you got a copy of it on your phone so you can email it, text it to someone, show it to someone right on your phone. You don't have to carry a physical copy with you at all times, but this day and age with technology, you should have a copy available to you on your phone. You have the authority that's spelled out in that guardianship letter. And that letter will say whether you're guardian of the person, guardian of the person in a state or both. Now, sometimes clients will say, well, I want to be guardian of the person and a state. And as I already told you, most individuals with a developmental disability, all they need is guardian of the person. But sometimes I'll have a parent tell me, well, no, I need guardian of the state because my individual might be taken advantage of. And what if they get tricked into signing up for a credit card or they get tricked into buying a house? And I understand where parents are coming from when they share that concern. They're coming from a place <clears throat> of being protective. But that concern, to be honest, in my opinion, is just not well grounded. Um, and, and here's why. <clears throat> like I said, I represent, <coughs> excuse me, I represent APSI and their guardian statewide for about 4,000 individuals. If there's a credit card company out there that is willing to sign individuals with developmental disabilities up for a credit card and, and take advantage of them in that way, by all means, call me and tell me about it. Uh, because if my daughter is 18, my daughter with Down syndrome, I'm gonna jump in the car, I'm gonna drive to where they are, and I'm going to happily let them sign my daughter up for any credit card they wanna sign her up for. And then I will drive her to the closest mall or Walmart or Target, and I will happily let her just max out that credit card, and I will laugh the whole time she does it. Because individuals, who are under guardianship and individuals, even in the structured supported decision-making who are eligible for these different government benefits, Medicaid and SSI and some of these benefits, by definition of being eligible for those benefits, in large part, 
they are judgment proof. They're, they're what us attorneys call judgment proof because we have limitations on who you can recover assets from and things like that. And um, you really, in, in terms of being taken advantage, of, I say it jokingly because you wouldn't actually want to 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 do what I just described. But I, I also really don't mean it jokingly. I mean, shame on any creditor that wants to sell her a car or credit card or anything like that, because they're never going to see a dime of that money. And that plays out all the time. Um, whether there's guardianship or not guardianship, an individual with a developmental disability, if, if somebody tries to extend credit of any kind to them and then tries to recover from them, they're not going to be successful. We see that over and over and over. And so the concern that most parents have isn't necessarily grounded only from the standpoint of um, they want to get a judgment against my daughter. I don't care. They're never going to get any of the money out of her and the, the judgment will expire in a few years. So, all right. A couple things you need to know once guardianship is established. There are some rules pertaining to guardianship that you need to be aware of. Some that are specific. I, I talked in the beginning about how there's different types of guardianship. There's people who are older that have Alzheimer's. There's people who are younger with developmental disabilities. Some of the rules were designed really to, to be geared towards elderly individuals, but they have kind of a, a whip around effect on people with developmental disabilities in a way we need to be aware of. One of those rules that was passed by the Ohio Supreme Court back in 2015 says that guardians of individuals with a developmental disability cannot be a direct service provider. And so there is a rule that says if you're the parent or I'm sorry, if you're the guardian of someone, you cannot also be a direct service provider. Now, what does it mean to be a direct service provider? I can make it really easy for you. An easy way to think of it is you're not allowed to be paid to do something on their behalf. If you're getting paid to work on their behalf in any capacity, you're probably a direct service provider. Now that was passed because of certain situations that pertain to elderly individuals. But what they didn't realize when I say they, I mean the group that, that passed some of these rules is we have literally thousands of individuals in the state of Ohio who have a developmental disability and have a family member or loved one who is a paid provider, especially this day and age when we are in an unbelievable um, provider shortage. I mean, whatever word you use when crisis is no longer applicable, that's the word you should use to describe the the provider situation across the state of Ohio. We just don't have providers. And if you're hearing that from your county board, I'll, I'll back them up just for a second. That's not a Medina County issue. That is an every single county in Ohio issue right now. And our phone rings off the hook with, I'm going off a little on tangent. Our phone rings off the hook these days with families who are mad at their county board because they can't get providers. And, and I will tell you, it's not the county boards. Now they're different counties that are making different efforts to try to fix the problem, but every single county right now is facing a huge challenge in that the, the demand for providers far exceeds the, the supply of providers. All right, enough about that. But because we have that incredible shortage of providers in the state of Ohio, we, we need in a lot of situations, family members to step in and be a provider. And you may have he heard of programs like shared living um, or you know, there's other programs where family members can be approved and be a paid provider through a person's Medicaid waiver or even through sometimes even county funding. If that happens and you're the guardian, you have an obligation to tell the probate court. Now, most courts have standardized forms that you can submit. I don't know whether Medina County does or not, uh, but you should let the court know that. If you know at the time you're establishing the guardianship that you're also applying or also are a shared living provider, you need to tell the magistrate, you need to tell the judge during the hearing so they can make the finding that that's okay. And in my experience, most counties are very quick to approve that. Um, again, I, and I'm not here to speak for Judge Dunn or his magistrates. I don't know specifically what, what their policies are in that regard. Maybe your SSA or county board does have more insight into that. But generally speaking, in my experience, especially here in central Ohio, every judge pretty routinely approves those because we have such a, a widespread provider shortage right now. They know families don't have other options in a lot of situations. But it is the burden of the family to make sure you get that approved by the probate judge. 
The next issue comes up with decision making. So now that you're appointed someone's guardian, in the state of Ohio, we have roughly around 50,000 people who are under guardianship. And of the 50,000 adults who are under guardianship, right around a third of those have developmental disabilities. So whatever a third of 50,000 is, 17, 18,000, whatever that number is, um, that many individuals with developmental disabilities have somebody else making decisions on their behalf. And as a guardian, you've got to be aware that decision making, one of the rules they've really driven in, in stone, and they being the Ohio Supreme Court, is that decision making should be a process. And it's a process that starts with understanding that as a guardian, you have an obligation to make decisions that are in the individual's best interest. And what does that mean? That means the course of action that maximizes what is best for the individual, including consideration of the least intrusive, most normalizing and least restrictive course of action possible given the needs of the individual. So the law used to be best interest means the course of action that, that maximizes what is best for the individual, period, end of sentence. But they've added in all these qualifiers, including consideration of what's least intrusive, what's most normalizing, what's least restrictive. And all of that is geared towards making sure guardians are mindful of the fact that you don't have to get involved in every single little decision. So when you're the guardian, you have that decision making authority and you certainly have some decision making responsibility. But that doesn't mean you should be telling a person what flavor of ice cream to eat when you, you go to the ice cream store. You know, if they they understand the different flavors and they can make their selection, then let them. Why would you want to make that decision on their behalf? Um, so again, it's just being mindful of the fact that you're there to make decisions, maximizes what is best, but you've got to be considering what's least intrusive, what's most normalizing and what's least restrictive. There's also other rules that pertain to guardianship saying you've got to do your due diligence when making decisions. And that means you've always got to be communicating with the individual, be fully informed about what he or she wants. You shouldn't be making a decision on behalf of someone without conferring with that individual. And different individuals have different communication levels. So maybe a person is, is nonverbal and, and has a hard time expressing what they want, and that's okay. You still have an obligation to try to communicate with them on, on their level. Maybe a person is, is higher functioning and is very good at expressing what they want and maybe sometimes too good at expressing what they want. You, you still have that obligation to go back to them every time and, and incorporate what they want into the decisions you're making on their behalf. You have an obligation to impose the least limitations on the individual's rights, freedom, or ability to control their own environment. Now, one of the th key things you can take away, this is a quote from an Ohio Supreme Court rule of superintendents. And you notice in here, right in the rule, it references the ward's rights. And that's because they do still have rights even after the guardianship is established. And so you have to recognize that. The Ohio Supreme Court has recognized that they do still have rights even after the guardianship is established. There's also a clause for person-centered planning. You know, it says a guardian shall strive to balance a ward's maximum independence and self-reliance with what's in the ward's best interest. So you've got to look at all these clauses as a whole to, to really kind of pare down to see that decision making is a process. It starts with understanding what's in the individual's best interest, communicating with the individual, thinking about what's least restrictive, and then balancing all of that with how do you promote their independence and self-reliance. And I think if you do this and you do it correctly, I think what you'll find a lot of times is for most day-to-day -day decisions, if the person has the capacity to make that decision on their own, let them. Uh, if the person has the capacity to make their own decisions, don't get involved. If um, the person doesn't have the capacity to make the decision, by all means, get involved. Uh, but it, you're not there to be the, the sheriff to re remove all risk and, and all potential bad things from their life uh, because you're, you're gonna be violating one or more of these tenants if you take that standpoint. And that gets me to my 1% rule. And let me explain what my 1% rule is, and then we'll talk about dignity of risk. So when my wife and I, when our daughter was born, she had all kinds of health issues. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with this group. I'm sure a lot of you did as well. We spent um, a significant amount of time in Children's Hospital. Uh, we went back on multiple different occasions for surgeries that would result in us being there for months. and. Um, we know she's going to have more heart surgery here in another couple of years, and it, it sometimes it feels like a marathon. But we have a joke in our house 
uh, because one time before, it was, I think it was one of her heart, I don't think, and it was before one of her heart surgeries, a doctor told us about something that could happen. And I asked, you know, what are the odds of that happening? And he kind of downplayed it and said, very unlikely. And I said, well, I kind of pressed him. What are the odds? And he said, Derek, it's, there's a 99% chance that won't happen. We just need to tell you about it just in case. So sure enough, that happened. And, and because that happened, you know, it bought us an extra probably month in the hospital because there were a lot of things that, that had to be fixed and corrected. And uh, my wife and I have a joke in our house. Anytime something happens with Megan and it seems like it's a never ending stream, that that's life in the 1%. You know, we'll say to each other, you know, that's life in the 1%. And uh, it feels like that. And for a lot of you, a lot of the families I'm talking to you tonight, you live in the 1%. You know, if you look around your community and you see what other parents are dealing with and some of the things you deal with, maybe it's behavioral issues, maybe it's medical issues, but your loved ones do face some challenges sometimes. And it, you do fall into this mindset of living life in the 1%. And if you were to tell me, you know, Derek, we have this great opportunity for your daughter. And, and let's say they're not talking about Megan. Maybe they're asking me about my youngest daughter. Her name is Leah and she's She's pretty adventurous and, and they tell me about this opportunity for her and they say, we think Leah will do great. We think it's going to be great for her. There's a 99% chance nothing will go wrong. I probably wouldn't bat an eye and I'd say, absolutely, let her do it. If you came to me and said, Derek, we've got this opportunity for Megan. Uh, there's a 99% chance it's going to be great. My mind is immediately going to go to, well, tell me about that 1% because I feel like you just identified what's going to go wrong. What happens with that 1%? And that's true for a lot of us families who have loved ones with developmental disabilities. And that absolutely bleeds into how we view guardianship sometimes uh, because we view it from a standpoint of being protective. And it's it's a never ending debate between my wife and I, and, and we have a great marriage, but we have a, it's a never ending debate between us in terms of how we promote Megan being independent uh, with how we also be, are mindful of the fact that it feels like every single thing that can go wrong for her medically does. And so that's hard to balance sometimes. And as a guardian, sometimes that impacts our decision making. And it hinders us as a guardian from letting them explore the full dignity of risk. Now, dignity of risk is a catchphrase, and I would encourage you to at some point Google dignity of risk. There is all kinds of literature out there on what dignity of risk means. Uh, there's a professor from the University of Minnesota that's done all kinds of writings on the dignity of risk and how much it benefits us on a day-to-day -day basis to have control of our own risks. And a lot of times with guardianship, when it's not going well, it's because someone's trying to take away someone else's dignity that comes from being able to manage their own risk. And sometimes people are under guardianship because they do need help managing their risk and they do need help managing the, the riskful, dis risky decisions they might be making. Uh, but we need to be mindful that the dignity of risk is, is an important thing to consider. And so where am I going with all this? As guardianship or as guardians, I always tell people we need to be mindful of the difference between bad habits and health and safety issues. You know, if if I have lots of bad habits, you have lots of bad habits. If we were all to turn our cameras on and take turns and share with the group, what is our three worst habits? we probably all sit here with our jaws on the floor saying, I can't believe people do this. I mean, every one of us have bad habits and you know, whether you want to admit it or not, you have bad habits that you really wouldn't want to say in front of a group. And you know they're bad habits and you still do them. And sometimes those bad habits can become really bad and, and that's not good, but, but sometimes the bad habits are things like, I drink way too much pop. You know, I drink Diet Dr. Pepper. It, it drives my wife up a wall. She can't stand it. We have so much literature out there about how bad pop is. And I assure you, she has texted or emailed me every bit of that literature at some point in my life. And yet every afternoon when I start to get tired, I go get a Diet Dr. Pepper out of the refrigerator here at my firm. And I choose that bad habit. I know someday I'm going to get some weird kidney disorder and then she's she's literally going to kill me when that happens. Uh, but it's that's my bad habit. I choose it. So if I'm the guardian, and if I'm looking at myself objectively, if, I, if, if my wife were the guardian of me, she would never let me have another can of pop. She would move heaven and earth to make sure I don't ever get it again. And that would be her violating her duties as guardian uh, because she has bad habits too. Uh, I'm not brave enough to state my wife's bad habits in front of a group of strangers, but I'm sure she has them. And if I were her guardian, I can, you know, besides saying she's 
never allowed to watch home improvement shows again. I don't know what else I'd say, but I'd come up with something. And that would be me screwing up my duties as a guardian because we're not there to manage bad habits. Even though to us, it may you may look at me drinking all this pop thinking that's a disaster waiting to happen. And it is, but that's a bad habit. And I get a lot of dignity out of that and I choose it. Now, there's a difference between drinking Diet Dr. Pepper and, and you know, something like snorting cocaine or something like that. Those are totally different scales. I'm not saying, you know, every bad habit has the potential to become a health and safety issue. You know, smoking is a bad habit. I, I don't like smoking myself. I would be very disappointed if one of my daughters came home one day and said, I'm a smoker. Look, I got cigarettes. And the parent in me would immediately start into a lecture and I would do everything I could to try to stop them from smoking. Um, but at the end of the day, and you know, I may regret ever letting Tiffany video this if it ever happens, I might actually have to let one of them smoke and get out of the way. If they're an adult, even if I were Megan's guardian, I would actually might have to actually let her smoke, even though I detest that bad habit and don't like it and think it's a recipe for disaster. Because who am I to sit there drinking Diet Dr. Pepper, slowly killing my liver to say you can't smoke a cigarette? Um, now, again, that's hard to swallow as a parent. And that really hits us in that 1% rule because you can think of all the reasons it can go wrong. And I'm not trying to pick on any one bad habit and say any one bad habit's okay or not okay. Again, every bad habit can become a health and safety issue. Uh, but as a guardian, we're not there to put them in a bubble and, and take away all risk. Other considerations, um, just be mindful. You know, when you have a person with a developmental disability, you do have to do the right estate planning, succession planning, road mapping, all that stuff. You've got to be mindful of succession planning for the guardianship. You know, there are different ways you can do succession planning. Some counties allow co-guardianship, some counties do not. I don't know whether Medina County does or does not allow co-guardianship. That'd be a good question for you guys to ask Judge Dunn next month. I think it'd be a good question for you to ask Judge Dunn um, what do you recommend guardians do to help set up successful succession plans? Because I can tell you every judge and every probate magistrate, they want you to think about succession planning. If you are the guardian for someone and you pass away, the guardianship does not end. Now the guardianship still exists and the probate court as the superior guardian becomes the decision maker for a moment in time. And it's then they will be scrambling to find family members or volunteers or someone that can step in to play that role of guardian. So they both appreciate and want you to think about succession planning. And I think co-guardianship is a great way to do succession planning if it's allowed in your county. And again, there are some counties that don't allow it. Um, other ways to do it are to make sure if you're the parent of a person with developmental disability, make sure part of your estate plan includes a nomination where you have said who you think the guardian should be if you're no longer able to do it. That doesn't have to necessarily be buried in a last will and testament somewhere. That can be something that you put uh, in a different type of document as long as it's done correctly, executed correctly. You could even file that with your next guardian's report. So it's in the guardianship file who you think the, the successor guardian should be. All of that is stuff that you need to think through. It's all stuff that your probate court will want you to think through. Circling back real quick, the court as the superior guardian, a few more things on what that means. You do have some annual filings, things like guardians reports that you have to file every year. If you move, you've got to let the court know. If the person under guardianship moves, you got to let the person, I'm sorry, you got to let the court know. You can move county to county. That's not a problem. And you can move out of state. Now, moving out of state requires um, more coordination. You got to work with the court, have the court's blessing. And there's a whole section of the revised code. It's revised code 2112 that talks about how to transfer a guardianship from one state to another. It, it happens, it works. I'm gonna be honest with you, it's a pain in the neck to do from a legal standpoint, but we, we've helped a lot of clients move in and out of the state and, and it absolutely can be done. Just don't move to Utah because their guardianship rules are really screwy and, and that's a hard state to move to. Um, reporting abuse, neglect and exploitation. If you're familiar with our developmental disability system, then you've heard the terms UIs and MUIs. And um, any, anybody that works for a County Board of Developmental Disability is what's called a mandatory reporter. They have to report certain incidents uh, to basically reporting it to themselves, a different division of the County Board where they then have somebody they either employ or contract with and investigates those incidents. 
as a guardian, you are a mandatory reporter of incidents of abuse, neglect, and exploitation to the probate court. So if the person you're the guardian for is the subject of an incident of abuse, neglect, or exploitation, you have an obligation to report that to the probate court. Now be careful because in the context of MUIs and UIs, um, I don't even know what it is. I think it's like there's 21 or sometimes it feels like there's 210 different categories of MUIs and UIs and all that stuff. I think it's like 21 or 22 categories these days. Not all of those need to be reported to the probate court. There are certain, there are lots of different types of unusual incidents and major unusual incidents that you don't have an obligation to report to the probate court, but then there are others that you do. Uh, complaints, if they're, if anybody's filing a complaint against you as a guardian, if somebody thinks you're doing a bad job, they can certainly let the judge know. And the judge or magistrate, they have um, wide discretion there in how to deal with complaints. Sometimes they'll send a court investigator out to see what's going on. Sometimes they'll just set the matter for hearing and say, hey, look, you know, Tiffany at the county board told us X, Y, Z is happening. What's really going on? Talk to us. And um, in those situations, you just want to be transparent with the court and let them know what's going on and just explain. These are the decisions I made. This is why I made them. Uh, and as long as you're doing your best act in the best interest of the individual and you're making rational, reasonable decisions, um, you should be okay. Guardianship of the estate, like I said before, it, it gets incredibly complicated. If the individual has an estate and you have to have a guardianship of the estate, then I would tell you, you definitely need to hire an attorney because that can get really um, obnoxiously complicated. Guardians have to do certain accountings and, and honestly, the way probate laws require guardians to do accountings doesn't make any sense. Uh, just the way we have to do the accountings. I, I have a finance background and I'm fairly good with numbers and all that and I, I've, I've never liked it. It just, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why we do it the way we do, but it is what it is. Um, so just be aware that if you have to have a guardian of the state, make sure you've got somebody that's helping guide you through that process. Guardian liability. People always want to know if I'm the guardian for someone, can I get sued? Do I have liability for that? Um, you can be sued, but it's not something you should lose sleep over. It's very rare, very, very rare. I spend a lot of time researching guardianship cases, and I will tell you, you won't find any cases in Ohio where a guardian was found liable that um, without reading the, the first couple paragraphs of the decision, you think, oh, well, yeah, of course this guardian was found liable. I mean, they're all cases like most of them involve an individual has an estate and the guardian stole all their money and blew it in Vegas gambling and, and that kind of stuff. And then the court tells the guardian they have to pay all the money back. I mean, those are your typical scenarios where guardians have liability. Now, guardians have been sued. Uh, guardians can be sued, but it's very rare. And guardians have a lot of great, great defenses. And there's a lot of case law from other states that weighs very heavily in um, that weigh very heavily in terms of protecting guardians from liability. So, the state of Washington, for example, has very similar rules and laws to the state of Ohio, and they have a Supreme Court case from the state of Washington that basically says where they had a professional guardian uh, who was accused of making really bad decisions based on what the individual under guardianship wanted that ultimately resulted in the death of the individual under guardianship. And that person was sued. And at the Supreme Court level, they said, wait a minute, the guardian was just carrying out the wishes, the known and stated wishes of the person under guardianship. And we have all these rules and all these qualifiers in our definition of best interest. How can we now hold the guardian liable when we've got all these rules in place saying give the person dignity of risk, give them that latitude to make decisions. And so can a guardian be held liable? Yes, if they do something egregiously bad, but if a guardian manages the information they have, um, you'll be fine. And honestly, of all the 50 some thousand guardianship cases in the state of Ohio, you won't find cases on very many ever where a guardian does get sued because it just it doesn't happen often because it would be a very high bar to meet. Uh, removal as guardian, you can lose your job, but I can assure you the probate court doesn't ever want to remove a guardian. And in my experience, probate courts give guardians lots of chances to get it right before they ever take someone's job away. 
Um, every county has a shortage of guardians, and so they're going to give you lots and lots of chances to fix whatever you're doing wrong or turn in whatever paperwork you haven't turned in. Um, sometimes, frankly, I think courts give people too many chances, but they give you lots of chances to get it right before they will remove you as guardian. Don't take advantage of that, though. I mean, at some point, judiciaries, they do draw the line and they will hold you accountable and they can remove you as guardian if you're flaunting something or ignoring a rule of the court. So make sure you pay attention to what your duties are and do your best to comply with those in a very timely manner. Other resources, we've got some links here to different videos. Um, Disability Rights Ohio has all kinds of resources on guardianship and, and some other documents that are really good. The Department of Developmental Disabilities has a quick five minute video kind of summarizing five things to know about guardianship. Uh, it's not as good, and, and I say that because it's me. It's a video of me talking about guardianship, and um, the, the DRO ones are actually better videos, so I'd, I'd go look at those. Uh, if you want to talk to me, I usually, I always offer this. It's a QR code that just connects you with our office. So if you want to talk about special needs planning or benefits or something like that, I'm happy to talk to you. If you want, if you have questions about guardianship, I will, um, I'll flip back to this in a second. Here's my email address, and you're more than welcome to email me. Uh, in the Q&A, if it's working, I always tell people don't put really personal questions in the Q&A. Shoot me an email or give me a call. If your question is, can we hire you to do guardianship of the person for us here in Medina? My answer is going to be no. Again, not because I don't like you folks in Medina, but you know, you're two hours away from me or an hour and a half away from me, uh, whatever it is, for, I don't know, probably an hour and a half. Um, and that's just not fair to you or me to because it shouldn't cost what I would have to charge for three hours of driving to do a guardian of the person. And frankly, I don't even know if Judge Dunn would let me charge you what, what I would want to charge to, to spend three hours in a car. Not that I don't like you, it's just that I don't like driving up and down I-71 that much. So, um, But if you have other questions about special needs planning or benefits or any of that stuff, don't hesitate to reach out because we represent people all over the state in those issues. And I'm very mindful of time. I hate it when presenters go over. It's 729. So I'm going to ask Tiffany if we have any questions. You do have one question there, and it's from earlier. Um, it says, how far in advance uh, of their 18th birthday would you see a lawyer to work on obtaining supported decision making? Good question. All right, so you're, you're closing in on that 18th birthday. If you're wanting to pursue guardianship, I would consult with an attorney probably about three months before that 18th birthday because they're going to talk to you about paperwork they need to get lined up, a statement of expert evaluation. You don't have to wait till they're 18 to file. You do have to wait until they're 18 to have the hearing. If you're doing the structured supported decision making, I would contact us. And again, if that's something, if you want to drive to Columbus, you're more than welcome to call us for that. Those, those are pretty straightforward documents. Um, I would call us probably, uh, you know, six weeks in advance because we can talk to you over the phone, talk about what we need the documents to say. And then you would have to bring your loved one down here, or if you're doing it up there with an attorney, you would need to meet with an attorney after they turn 18. So you need them to turn 18 before they sign the documents. You don't want them to sign all those documents while they're minors. So you want them to turn 18 first and then sign the documents. But you want to have it all set up so that you kind of time it fairly close to that 18th birthday. Good question. That's the only question that has come through the chat as at this point. Um, I'm going to take that as a sign for my ego that I just did a great job of explaining everything and everything was just crystal clear. I will agree with you on that. Yeah, um, you ha everybody has Derek's um, information. Uh, I will get that PowerPoint from Derek. I will send that out. I also want you to know that tonight's presentation was recorded. It will be put on our YouTube channel within um, the next 48 hours. So when I send out the link to the YouTube channel, I will send out um, Derek's presentation. And uh, Derek mentioned a couple different times through his presentation tonight that we will be following this up with a presentation from Medina County Judge Dunn. And that presentation is actually Thursday, July 21st at 6 p.m. So if that's something you wanna put on your calendar, go ahead and do that. Um, information will be coming out soon on that as well. So I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Derek, thank you for all of your great information. Um, I hope this was helpful for many of our families. Actually, I know it was helpful for many of our families. So thank you again. Um, and thank you for everyone that joined in tonight. Yeah, thank you very much.